Hello and welcome to the Controller Talk podcast presented by Danfoss North America. Our goal is to bring you information about using Danfoss controls in the supermarket and warehouse industry, specifically in the U.S. and Canada. We're doing these twice a month for now. You can catch these podcasts wherever you get your podcast, and it's also available through the Danfoss Ref Tools app. For the video version, check us out on the Danfoss North America YouTube page. Search for Controller Talk to see our video collection. I'm Dave Yoder, along with Chris Brown. So, Chris, we can't talk about the Ravens? Is that uh, what you're telling me? Nope. Mm, nope. We're moving right along. Uh, kind of like Greg Roman, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Is that you that's been putting those signs up all over town? Uh, I've had help, I think. <laughs> okay. Did you back a Mayflower truck up to his house yet? I, I just, I'm surprised it hasn't happened already. Okay. We don't want to. What do I know? <laughs> we don't want to spike, spike your blood pressure, so let's uh, keep it moving I, I, here. I guess uh, the only, <laughs> only extra thing out there out there is we did make the playoffs on like the Steelers. So. Oh, you have a point right. there. Yeah, that is true. We that probably is. just lost half our <laughs> listeners. <laughs> now we're down to four. <laughs> <laughs> Put an asterisk next to metrics on this one, Mike. We'll have to see. <laughs> Uh, they can always email us about that. Uh, yeah. yeah, they're distaste for you trashing the Steelers. Way to turn that into a plug for the... Yeah. There you go. <laughs> That's right. At least I won't be getting as many uh, emails about uh, getting stuff shipped from China <laughs> yeah, in my spam account. <laughs> All right. So, you know, Chris, a few years back, if you go way back to 2008, in the days of the 255... The alarm menu, uh, the alarm menus changed, and they added a whole bunch of options. So people knew that they were getting flexibility, but they don't always know how to use all this flexibility. So in today's podcast, we're going to cover all that, and uh, conveniently, it all fit into ten uh, distinct points of how to uh, get this alarm stuff figured out. All right. And um, if I remember here, I will talk about the number one question that I get. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's a lot of, uh, steps, uh, to get what you want, but that's basically because you've got all this flexibility in there and we're going to conquer them piece by piece here to harness the power of the alarm. Yeah. Very relevant subject because everybody yeah. wants to know when something bad's going on, right? <laughs> um, they prefer not to, they prefer <laughs> alarms only happen between eight and five Monday yeah, to Friday, yeah. but that's not reality, man. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, yes, in my pondering about this subject, I decided that uh, that alarm, that refrigeration alarm, is just a two-headed beast. Yes, you can't live with it, and you can't live without it. <laughs> All right, so let's dive right into the options and see how they fit together, what I call the 10 steps to enlightenment. All right, so first of all, each alarm that you have in the controller uh, has like five different options that you can do with that individual alarm. You can set it uh, to normal, and that means that if you're sending that alarm out somewhere, specifically to like an IP address or an email or something like that, it's only going to go out once. Yep. Uh, you can set it to critical instead of normal, and in that case, it'll go out to more than once if you allow it. Um, the default is to send that out every hour, but if someone... Uh, right or wrong, if someone acknowledges the alarm, that means that they've seen it, they're taking ownership of it, and at that point, it's going to stop sending it out over and over. Um, then we go up the up the ladder here, in a way, but uh, the next option is called severe, and that means that it's an alarm that you want to get, but you don't want to get it every hour, and maybe less often. So severe is, um, by default... It gets sent out once a day uh, unless someone acknowledges the alarm. Oil fails are a good example for that one. Um, and then you have two more options for the alarm itself. You can set it to log only, means I kind of want to know about it, but I don't want it to be sent out to anybody. It'll just put it in the alarm log of the controller. And then uh, the last option is uh, disabled, means that, okay, I've got an alarm I can set up, but I want that thing turned off and, and keep it off. And um, so, yeah, it's not going to actually be able to alarm. Yep. Yep. The, the little asterisks, I guess, I'll throw in there with, <clears throat> excuse me, with severe and critical is case controllers, pack controllers, all those, because 
when they send their alarm, when they transmit their alarm over to the system manager, they're only sending it once. And then it's up to the system manager and it's setting to decide whether it's critical or severe to resend it over and over. Gotcha. I, I can't remember yeah. if we've talked in the past on podcasts or not about the fact that if a case controller is offline when it goes into high temp or any other alarm for that matter, if it's not communicating with the system manager at that point, it's not going to transmit that alarm. Right. And yeah. so setting this uh, i only bring this up because it's something some guys ask about sometimes setting that to severe or critical doesn't help with that in any way if, if it's offline then you, the only thing you can count on is the offline alarm yeah exactly yep. yeah um so it it doesn't apply in, in that way with case controllers uh, you're still going to get the alarm and then the system manager can send it out over and over again but you can't do anything to combat if the case controller didn't transmit it the first time when it originally was created. Right. Yeah. I think of the system manager when you're dealing with case controllers and pack controllers, I think of the system manager as the filter. Yep. So you might have the uh, capability to have a hundred alarms come out of the case controller, but in the system manager, you can filter that down to six or something. And then the system manager takes it from there. Agreed. Yep. So speaking of filtering, let's move on to topic number two. Excellent segue. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're setting these alarms up, one of the other fields you're going to see in there is an action number that that's set. And uh, maybe action arguably could have been, you could have picked something else yeah. for, for the naming of it. My vote was was uh, group number. <laughs> and I don't disagree yeah. with you. <laughs> yeah, that's the number one question I get. What's an action number? Yeah. Um, so you can set this value anywhere between one and eight log only can actually, you could set it to zero, I guess, theoretically, but in general, it's going to be something one through eight. Um, there's no priority given to something that's set to one instead of eight. There, there's no additional benefits in terms of that number that's being set. This is allowing you to group your alarms in, in different groups so that you can use, do different things with them. So just say, for example, you've got three racks on one system manager and you've got a alarm light for each rack, one separate for each rack, for example. Um, you don't want all the action numbers to have an action number of one because then any one of the three racks would trip all three lights or none yep. of them. Yep. This allows you to, to say all my rack one alarms are gonna be action one, rack two alarms action two, and, and my third rack action and three. And that way you can separate them so that you can do different things with them. Now you could still dial them all out to the same place, or if you wanted to, you could lump them together because when you get into your routing section, you can pick and choose which action numbers trigger an event. I'm probably stealing some thunder from you or me later on in this, <laughs> that's but quite a right. um, that's the general idea of this action number is that you're, you're able to group your alarms in a given system manager um, in, in a, up to eight different groups if you wanted to. Uh, so that's number two, uh, item number three or topic number three is, is what can you do with these alarms once you, they've generated and you've got them in the controller sitting there in the alarm log. Um, so you've got six different options here. Uh, one is kind of like what I just mentioned. You can have a, a physical relay that, that's wired into the system and you can trigger that relay, um, based on an alarm. Uh, it's up to 10 different alarm relays if you're looking at the 255 and then five in, in our newer models, 355, 800, 800A. We've, I don't think we've ever, I've never had the conversation of more than that. It's pretty rare. Yeah. So that, that should be sufficient for anything that you're looking at there. Um, you can transmit these alarms to a remote IP address. Again, 255 all the way up to 800A, any model there and in between. Um, if you're working with someone like a, a monitoring company like Danfoss, then those that, that information could be transmitted to a remote IP in that way. Um, they can be sent out uh, with a remote IP address using XML commands. This requires two-way acknowledgement, so the receiving party would have to actually send the controller back uh, verification that it received the alarm. Or otherwise, you get a different alarm that's going to generate in the system manager to say, hey, I tried to send this alarm, but it didn't really get out there. Um, so maybe not the guys listening here, but just that they would actually be involved in that backside of it. But just something for them to be aware of is if we're sending alarms over XML, that there needs to be verification coming back to the controller that that's received. Yep. Um, that one's not in the 255. That would only be the 355, 800, and 800A. 
and then just so we don't make the 255 feel like it's left out <laughs> uh, right. we did if you're still dealing with that i mean there's still plenty of them out there right right yeah uh they they could dial alarms out over a phone mo- modem phone line setup so you don't have that with anything above the 255 but with the 255 that was the prevalent the the, the main option for years and years yeah. you were sending yeah. alarms out over a phone modem right um, so that that's still there if that's the system that you're working with. Alarm logger would be number seven in, in this category. So uh, 255 and the 800 and hopefully the 800A. Yeah. Uh, we see the alarm logger there as well. But when these system managers receive or generate an alarm, then they can transmit to an alarm logger that's in the front of the store or manager's office, wherever that might be mounted um, to, to display them there for people to, to see that there's something going on that needs to be looked at. And then last, but certainly not least, this is becoming more and more utilized here yeah. um, as time goes on. But you can send uh, your alarms out via email. And this started with the 255, and it goes all the way up through the 800A. And there's been um, more and more work done there, whether it's encryption, SSL, all those things are being added as, as we move along. Um, but sending alarms out via email is now an option that you have as well when you're trying to get that data out. Right. Yeah. I think we talked about it in a previous podcast uh, where the emails in general, you're sending them out under an SMTP format. Typically they're not encrypted, although it's an option in the newer controller and um, it has to be able to find the uh, information on the email server. Exactly. It's got to be able to hit that server. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Item four. When uh, alarms are sent to a remote IP address, there is a schedule involved in that screen. And by default, the schedule is disabled. So if you miss that, your alarms aren't going to go out. And then that leads to much frustration. Um, So, yeah, you got to enable that schedule. Um, When you flip it from none to standard, then it defaults to 24-7, which is what most people want. And then... um, you just need to plug in the correct IP address and the correct port number for the receiving party that's going to be getting that. And um, in full transparency, there's only two monitoring companies that I know of, and that's uh, Danfoss, um, which is what they call uh, All Sense monitoring at this point, and then Emerson's the other company that's doing it. Um, and then uh, if you have that 255 and you're sending out alarms uh, over a phone modem, then that one also uses a schedule and it works the same way. So uh, moving on to item five, if you're sending alarms to a remote location, you have the option to use a test alarm. And uh, typically that's set up where you send it out something at least once a day. And uh, that tells everybody that, hey, everything's still working. And um, with these action numbers, you have the option to decide whether or not that daily test alarm is going to trip your alarm relay or trip uh, your logger, essentially, whether or not it sends a message to the logger. Some people want it, some people don't. But if you set up the uh, alarms uh, and action numbers accordingly, you can uh, set it up so it doesn't send alarms on a daily basis where you don't want them. Right. So... Um, that test alarm usually will clear on its own in about 30 seconds or so. So that's what you should expect. Um, You can repeat those test alarms if you want, but repeating them more than once a day kind of implies that somehow you're you're keeping an eye on that or somehow you're keeping track so that if you miss one, you can uh, start digging into it. Yep. Um, and I've seen this uh, a fair amount of times, and, and you have too, that occasionally, especially if you've got a bunch of alarms that go into alarm or a bunch of them that clear at the same time, sometimes the controller uh, at the top of the front of it, it, the red LED will stay red instead of flipping back to green when the last alarm clears, and it'll keep saying alarm at the top of the screen. And uh, you look in active alarms, nothing there. You look in acknowledged alarms, nothing there either, and you're like, what gives. Um, but I found that most of the time, if you just send a test alarm, um, even if it's not really going anywhere beyond the controller, that'll reset it. And that was, from what I saw, at least it was mostly on the 255. I don't hear about that much anymore. That is true. So it shouldn't yeah. be something you're experiencing if you're dealing with the 800s or 800As. Yeah. yeah, that's true. That's called progress. There you go. <laughs> 
Um, let's progress on the item number six. Uh, so if we circle back to action numbers again. And so now we're looking at, okay, we, we've got them all set up the way we want. Now I need to apply those groups the way I, I want them to, whether it's the dial out or emailing the alarms or what have you. So when you're on this routing section, um, each one of these these touch points, as far as a, um, a relay or a, a remote dial out, is going to have a column for each action number, one through eight. And so with, with each one of these touch points, you're going to go through and decide whether you want to enable one of these eight action numbers in, in these columns. And so when, when you're in the individual cells there, you've got four different options, I guess you could say. Um, the first one just being a, a dashed line, that means we're not using that action number to trigger whatever that touch point is. But then when you hit your drop down there in that cell, you get three other options. And so um, the first option you'll see is, is a, a capital X. This is probably 90% of the time or more what ends up being selected if you're going to choose anything. This just means if uh, an alarm that has an action number of say one or, or whatever that cell, that column's associated with, if an alarm with that action number's been generated in the controller, the X is saying, I don't care what con what time of day it is, I want to send this thing out or I want to turn that relay on 24-7, um, so, so any time of day. Then you get a, a uppercase D for day and a, a uppercase N for night. And, and so this is going to, both of these options would refer back to what your store hours are, are programmed to back under the system tab in your system manager. And so D for day is if the alarm generates and it's within the open and close hours of the store, then it'll still do exactly the same thing that NX would do. It's still going to either turn that alarm relay on or it's going to send that alarm out to a, an email address or a monitoring company. If it's outside of the those hours, though, so if it's past the store closed hours, it's going to treat it like it never happened. Yeah. And I think from what I've seen, even if it stays active, once you hit the day, the, the open hours again, it's still not going to send out. It's that point yeah. in time when it generated. It has to occur during that time. Yep. yep. Yeah. Um, so keep that in mind is if it. It's a high temp alarm on a case and it stays active for 12 hours until your opening hours again. That doesn't mean it's going to dial out as soon as the store opens or, or when those open hours hit. Right. Um, and then vice versa for N for night. Maybe this is something where you, you don't have people in the store at night and you just want to send out alarms when there's not somebody there. Um, but the, the choosing an N setting for an action number is only going to apply it to sending out an alarm if it generates after your closed hours and, and before your open hours for the store. Okay. So that's that section. Um, number seven would be there's another column for what you want the stop function to be for each touch point there. Um, your options being clear, time, acknowledge, time, repeat, and acknowledge, repeat. Uh, so of those five, it uh, clears, again, what do you see three quarters of the time, if not more? Yeah. It's usually yeah. clear. So when the alarm clears, when the pressure drops down below the, sep the, the threshold for the alarm or the case temperature drops back down below its threshold, that's when we consider it the problem cleared. And that's when we would turn the relay off or we would stop dialing out if we're set to critical or severe um, if you choose clear. Time would just be a, a time-based function. So if you want to relay to trigger for a half an hour after an alarm generates and then um, it's still active, you say, I don't care. I still want to turn my, my relay light back off. Then time would be your choice. I, I don't see that one used too often. No, not at all. Um, acknowledge maybe is the second most frequent used, but but not too close to clear. But this would be someone actually has to go in and, and select that they've acknowledged that alarm in there. Um, <clears throat> before that, that touch point would stop, before that relay would turn off or we'd stop dialing out. And then you have time and acknowledge with a repeat function where um, if you, you choose these and the alarm's still active after a period of time, it'll repeat what it's doing again. So high temp alarm, we acknowledge it. 30 minutes later, it's still, or 60 minutes, whatever we choose for that repeat time. If the alarm's still active, it would trigger again and, and force us to acknowledge it a second time if it remains active. Yep. Okay. Those last two are mainly used when you have an alarm relay. Uh, something in the store, like an alarm relay, like a buzzer or a light, or you're tripping a signal to a security company. That's usually where you see those two. Yep. Yeah. So 
we're really into the deep of the deep part of the alarms now. I wonder if anybody's still with That's us. That's what they're here for. <laughs> yeah, boy, this is really good stuff here. <laughs> All right, so there's only two or three more to go here, and then we'll have our 10 steps to alarm enlightenment. All right, so item number eight, if the uh, alarm actions need to be changed from maybe you've got three or four different ones and, you know, and you're thinking – you know what, I, I've got so many alarms in here, I don't even know what action number all these are using. And you just want to change them all. On the 255, you can do, uh, you can decide in there in the routing screen what number you want to change them to, because it'll let you pick. Um, I have not seen that uh, beyond the 255. Yeah, I can't remember <clears throat> off the top. I'd have to go looking. <laughs> yep, yep. And then uh, item number nine, so each alarm can have its own alarm delay. Um, typically, typically, you have the choice to have alarm delays unless it's an offline alarm. I, I think your, your typical kind of baked in alarm delay is more like two minutes on those, um, but you can't change those. And then... Um, if you're dealing with uh, your cases that are um, I.O. cases, meaning they're using a board point like a relay board or an input board, then those cases have an extra delay you can program uh, called delay after defrost. And you can set it to 15 or 30 minutes or whatever, whatever you think you need to get the case to pull down to temperature after defrost. Uh, but if you have case controllers, you have something called a pull down delay. And that is supposed to cover your time of defrost plus your runoff time, if you have it, plus the time to pull down. Yep. So if you make that too short, you're going to get lots of alarms. It replaces your normal high temp delay. It doesn't be, yeah. it's not added to it. Right, right. Because right. in the IO cases, when you go into defrost, the uh, alarms are overridden automatically. Yep. And then you have some flexibility to do that extra delay after defrost. But uh, case controllers, you have to intentionally program that pull down delay. Yeah. So 90 minutes, 120 is a lot of the values we see in there a lot yeah. of times. Yep. So last but not least, number 10. Uh, so when you're in your alarm log screen of these system managers, um, you get a couple tabs there that you can look at. And one of them's status. And so it, it's going to give you a list of all the rack the case, the miscellaneous, all the alarms that you've got in the controller. <clears throat> and you can kind of get an idea of where things stand if you're testing an alarm out or just want to check on it in general. Um, so one of the messages you, you can see there, and, and hopefully it's the one that you see, <laughs> is <laughs> right? just the word okay. So it means everything's fine. It, it's not, it hasn't reached its uh, threshold to, to start counting down or any of that. It means it's everything's hunky-dory and, and you yep. can move on with your life. Right, right. Um, if you see a number, which is going to be in, in units of seconds, and it's maybe even counting down, um, that's we've reached our high temperature or high pressure set point, whatever the condition is, and now we're going through our alarm delay before we actually generate the alarm. And so when that number hits zero, that means, okay, our, our timeout's expired, and we're going to generate that alarm now because we've met both conditions with the temperature or pressure and, and the time delay. Um, so that would be what that number that you see counting down is meant to reflect. Uh, if you see trip, then that means that you're, uh, you've already hit all your, your credential criteria to generate the alarm. And it should be something that's either shown as an active or an acknowledged alarm in those logs. If you see trip there, um, and so a lot of guys will, uh, normally check this section before they head out just to make sure everything looks, looks clear there. Right. Yep. So they know if they see 180 in there and it keeps counting down, they have three minutes to get out. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's one way to look at it. Yep. Or that some guys will say, hey, what's going on and fix it. And yeah. there is a, there is also an info tab right next to this this option too mm -hmm. that for when we are dialing out to a monitor or an email, that's a really good section that that you can look at to get some feedback on if somebody's not receiving an email with the alarm or the monitoring company saying, hey, I didn't get these alarms, even though you know they're there, that might tell you why you haven't seen them. Maybe it can't hit the server or maybe it wasn't even trying to send them out. And you go back to one of the other topics and see, well, I never had my schedule enabled. Right. Yep. Or the routing was changed and 
Yep. Now it doesn't care about action one alarms or something like that. Yep. Yep. Mm. All right. So there you have it. 10 items to help you become the alarm master. That's right. That's everyone's goal this year. All right, Chris. Hey, let's move on to our favorite section called Stump Chris, where I throw a semi-impossible question at you and see if you know the answer. <laughs> of course, I have not shared the question or the answer with you. VLT 10. <laughs> How'd I do? <laughs> uh, sorry, that was last one. <laughs> VLT 5 was the correct answer. <laughs> I got to update my cheat sheet. <laughs> uh, obviously. Uh, all right. So your question this time around, I think you might have a case of deja vu here because I may have asked this one before <laughs> last year. And since we're talking about alarms, uh, we know that you can suspend alarms in the controller. What's the longest amount of time in hours that you can put in there if you wanted to suspend alarms? Ugh. Yeah, and let's let's use the 255 as an example. Longest time in hours that you can yeah. spend. Well, the problem is I can't do math because if we change the units <laughs> to minutes, I might have it. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that to you. Just hit me with hours. Just hours. <laughs> yep. Um. Take a wild guess. 300 hours. You're close. Yeah. But still wrong. Well, I told you I can't do math, so what'd you expect? <laughs> you got through the University of Maryland well, somehow. <laughs> calculator. <laughs> I guess. Uh, believe it or not, it's 255 hours. Ah. Uh, this... Yeah. Yeah, answer so <laughs> obvious in hindsight. <laughs> that was your second guess. Yeah. Yeah, which works out to 10.6 days. Yeah. That's a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah, give you time to take a case out, put another one in. Well, now I know what 999 minutes is in hours. So. <laughs> there you go. All right. Hey, how about uh, before we wrap it up, we'll hit a listener mail here. So um, Al from Albuquerque had a question for us. It's an alarm question. Go figure. Um, he said, hey, uh, my store went into power fail and uh, I didn't get any alarms. And no, like the store didn't get called when the store was out of power. Yep. And he wants to know why. For our, for, uh, I'll answer this kind of assuming it's a Danfoss monitoring sure. usage or that's what they're using for their alarms. So if a controller goes down, um, I mean, there's obviously no way for it to send out an alarm. And if there aren't other alarms on a host network with it that were powered up to send the alarm out of a host com or host count air, then you're, you're in a situation where you've got no no contact with it. And, and so the way that our monitoring service typically works is that test alarm that we were talking about. Um, they receive that and use that as contact verification. And so they're only looking maybe once a day, twice a day to see if they have contact with a store or not. And so if it's powered down, um, then they're not going to necessarily know it with their no contact report, possibly until the next day when they don't receive that test alarm. Yep. Yep. And if the controller has no power, the controller can't send alarms out. We haven't added that feature yet. We're working on it. <laughs> That's right. Some kind of super cap or a battery or something like that. Yeah, but, yeah. but yeah, with modern networks, it's possible to send alarms out when you have no power, but you got to think about all the things you had to power off the generator at that point. Yeah. And some customers do that. They power up the controller, switches, routers, all that good stuff off the generator when the power goes out. And uh, it can work. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we've learned over the years that if you want to power up your controller with a UPS to try to get you through, then that means that all, everything in the system has to also have power as well. But that UPS can be the weak link because it's good for a couple years at least, mm -hmm. but someday it's going to die. And when it does, it takes the controller with it. It might be three in the morning. It might be three in the afternoon. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, generator power is one way to get around that. Yep, agreed. Okay. Well, I'm sure Al from Albuquerque will be happy with your answer, or at least that he got an answer. So Maybe Bucky or Butchie have an answer for him <laughs> if he doesn't like mine. Well, that's also a possibility. <laughs> They'll probably get it on our refrigeration forum and figure it out. There you go. All right. So if you'd like to drop us an email with a suggestion for topics to cover, a question, or comment, you can email us at ControllerTalkNorthAmerica at DanFoss.com. That's Controller Talk North America at danfoss.com. Thanks for listening. Our studio and video engineer is Michael, don't call me Mike Beckerman, and our audio engineer, Raul Garcia, is still here, believe it or not. <laughs> 
Maria is back and still running this show, and uh, the new guy, Josh, still MIA. <laughs> we'll track him down. We'll send somebody out to look for him. Until next time, for Chris Brown, I'm Dave Yoder. Stay cool.